When you think about the Confederacy of Independent Systems, oftentimes the mind wanders towards the Trade Federation, the Nemoidian run trade cartel that was featured as the main evil faction in Episode 1 of Phantom Menace. We took a closer look at their rise and fall in one of our previous videos, but the Trade Federation was just one portion of the massive alliance formed between Adoram headquarter corporations during the Separatist Crisis. Their main role during the war was actually to just fuel a massive navy, which they already had access to as one of the premier shipping companies in the world. It's as if Amazon joined a confederacy that is trying to break away from the United States, but instead of building armored vehicles, they just put armored plating and sandbags on those silent and deadly Rivian delivery trucks. And then for the employee slash cannon fodder, they'll change the point system so that every kill you get gives you more points towards your quota. And if you don't meet the quota, well, that little tiny chip in your head that they implanted there when you thought you were resting in those wellness chambers explodes. Anyway, the Trade Federation didn't have many living employees that they harvested from the dead remains of smaller retail competitors they destroyed. Instead, they had millions upon millions of battle droids, vehicles stored in their massive freighters, which they used to enforce their will. All of which came from one of the largest corporations in the entire galaxy, the Techno Union. Most people, when they hear the word Techno Union, probably think about Techno Gumby Tambor and his malfunctioning EQ knobs. But hidden behind this comically inept individual is one of the largest industrial manufacturing conglomerates in the entire galaxy. Without them, the CIS might have never broken away from the Republic in the first place. The Techno Union originally started out as a manufacturing guild in the same way that the Trade Federation started out as a transport and trade guild. The idea behind such guilds was quite simple, group together like-minded corporations and fight larger mega conglomerates who have monopolies over certain sections of the industry and also lobby for a more friendly business environment for your industry. The Trade Federation and Techno Union were not just similar by accident, of course. The foreman or leader of the Techno Union, Watt Tambor, actually modeled his own organization's ascension after tactics used by the Trade Federation and maintained close relationships with the company. He used the goodwill that his industry generated by developing the Adarim and bringing manufacturing jobs to the area and leveraged that into political capital. Eventually, the Techno Union would get a seat of their own in the Galactic Senate. We have to remember that for a corporation to get their own seat was a huge deal. I mean, most member states didn't even get direct representation. They usually had to share a representative with an entire sector or region of the galaxy. Imagine if you, say, lived in North Dakota, but because of a lack of population and economic value to the nation, your representative in the national legislature also represented Montana, South Dakota, Wyoming, and Idaho. These are all pretty different states with very different needs. But then you see a company like Amazon or Facebook get their own representative because their contribution to the national GDP is far more significant. I'm sure you'd be pretty upset about that. On top of that, Watt Tambor, like New Gunray, filled the higher echelons of the Techno Union with his fellow Skakoans. Although unlike the Nemoidians, the Skakoans didn't murder everyone on the board, they just used very aggressive business tactics and acquired a lot more assets, bringing worth to this organization. As the Outer Rim began to flourish from an economic standpoint, mainly thanks to the efforts of the Trade Federation's fleet and the Techno Union's manufacturing and raw resource mining operations, the Republic attempted to regulate the region once again. One of the concessions made to the Techno Union in exchange for accepting new regulations and tariffs in the Outer Rim was to allow this company to essentially raise their own military and protect their own assets. Even though the Republic was wary of corporations being in control of some of the largest military forces in the galaxy, the Republic's lack of a federal military and its inability to stop bandits and other criminal organizations like the Stark Combine meant that they really didn't have any other choice but to allow these corporations to at least protect themselves. Ultimately, a huge opening presented itself for the Techno Union when the Trade Federation's ambitious goals of dominating the Outer Rim came under the scrutiny of the Republic. The Trade Federation's dabbling in manufacturing, especially weapons, vehicles, and droid manufacturing, drew some red flags from regulators. The Trade Federation was already vertically integrated into the shipping industry, and now they were looking to also manufacture goods for trade, which would lead to their complete dominance over all commerce 
in the Outer Rim. The Techno Union, which was actually closely aligned to the Trade Federation and shared many business interests and even board members, seemed like a perfect place to park a lot of the Trade Federation's more controversial assets. And that's exactly what happens. So let's talk about all of the Techno Union's holdings throughout their history. It's actually kind of ridiculous. The company starts off by purchasing the lava planet of Mustafar 300 years before the Clone Wars started. They made a killing off of mining precious gems and metals, along with some more mundane industrial materials. Soon after, the Techno Union would acquire four roast shipyards and add it to their portfolio. The Scott Cohen would eventually take over the Techno Union, as we mentioned before, as the dominant species running all operations. The Scott Cohens were an interesting race. They evolved on a methane-rich world and required pressure suits and methane rebreathers to sustain their life outside of their own planet. This meant it was very difficult for the species to integrate with the rest of the galaxy. They became heavily reliant on technology in order to survive off their home world and would view technological development as key to their species' success and survival. And so the Skakoans would naturally fund many R&D labs on their home planet. And at the same time, they would aggressively pursue manufacturing companies and also R&D companies. One of the first major corporations they took over was Bactoid Industries, a Gian Ocean heavy industry manufacturing company that utilized its own workers and drones for cheap labor. Bactoid Industries had two major divisions, Bactoid Armor Workshop and Bactoid Combat Automata. Bactoid Armor Workshop produced all sorts of vehicles for the civilian and military market, ranging from tanks to starships. They would supply the B-1 battle droid with the E-5 blaster. They also made larger combat droid vehicles like the DSD-1 dwarf spider droid and the OG-9 homing spider droid, along with the armored assault tank, multi-troop transport, single trooper aerial platform, and even the hyena-class droid bomber and rogue-class Porax 38 starfighter. Before the Battle of Naboo occurs, Bactoid Armor Workshop was a blue chip stock and held by a lot of institutional investors. Their involvement, however, in the illegal blockade in Naboo, where their armored assault tank played a very visible role, led to the Trade Federation distancing itself from the company and also individuals like New Gunray. Eventually, Bactoid Armored Workshop would have to be disbanded and then its assets would be secretly loaded onto Bactoid Combat Automata's portfolio. Watan Bor at the time was not only the foreman of the Techno Union, he was also an executive for Bactoid Armor Workshop. He would be heavily involved in the dissolvement of Bactoid Armor Workshop facilities in the Inner Rim and Core and help move those facilities to the Outer Rim. The other wing of Bactoid Industries was Bactoid Combat Automata. This was privately owned and more or less kept a secret from outsiders. And the Outer Rim was a terrific place to hide illicit companies manufacturing illicit goods. Bactoid Combat Automata's primary business was the creation of battle droids. This included everything from the B-1 battle droid to the B-2 super battle droid and also the BX series commando droid. The Techno Union would also purchase Harchal Engineering, which was a small ship manufacturer. They built ships for the CIS Navy like the Vulture Droid, Cethipede class transport shuttle, and the C-9979 landing craft. They also produced the IG-227 Hailfire class droid tank. They're also the owners of Colicoid Creations, one of the most terrifying manufacturers of deadly droids. They would produce the Droidica after their own insectoid image and also produce other nightmares like the Droid Tri-Fighter, the Drotch class boarding ship, the Pistoeca Sabotage Droid, otherwise known as the Buzz Droid, and the Trident class assault ship. Now so far we've only mentioned Techno Union holdings that produce ships for the Confederacy of Independent Systems, but the Clone Wars was very much like a wet dream for all military industrialists. Because of the corruption and lack of leverage that the Republic held over Adoram companies, most corporations, including the Techno Union, would play both sides of the war, profiting from the destruction of their products by other products they were selling the other side. Even though most senators in the Galactic Republic knew that this was happening, they couldn't really punish these companies because there was a major risk that they would just stop producing weapons for the Republic and then join the Confederacy of Independent Systems. The Techno Union also owned Mon Cala Shipyards, which was aligned with the Republic. This company would also later on supply the Rebellion with capital ships. Techno Union also owned Corellian Engineering Corporation. They supplied the Republic's only paramilitary force, the Judicial Department, with corvettes and light cruisers. The Techno Union was even associated with Quad Drive Yards, who essentially produced everything from the Venator-class Star Destroyer to the Delta-7 Eat Sprite. 
Their subsidiary, Rothana Heavy Engineering, produced the LAAT, the ATTE Walker, and the Acclimator class assault ship. Quad Drive Yards would secede from the Techno Union before the Clone Wars would start. The Techno Union even owned Blast Tech Industries, who supplied the majority of the firearms used by the Galactic Republic. But like KDY, Blast Tech would also leave the Techno Union before the start of the Clone Wars. Generally speaking, throughout Star Wars history, Separatist movements do not have a good chance of succeeding. It's not just because of the lack of political support or will to fight. It's usually because of the powers that they are fighting are generally in control of the industrial and economic might of the galaxy or nation. If we take a look at our own world in 1860, a year before the American Civil War started, the northern states produced 17 times more cotton and woolen textiles than the south. They also produced 32 times more firearms and had begun the mechanization of farming, which increased the yield a free farmer could harvest from their land. The South, on the other hand, was both morally and economically backwards. The majority of their economic output was based on slave labor. When the war began, the South had arguably a much richer military tradition and some of the best generals in the nation, but their efforts to industrialize rapidly could not keep up with the North, which already had a massive start. In many ways, the Confederacy never had a chance in a long war against the Union. It's for the same reason why in World War II, the second the United States committed to supplying its allies with weapons and tanks, the war was basically over for Nazi Germany. I mean, Nazi Germany did have one of the most aggressive and experienced military forces in the world, along with some of the finest tank and airplane designs, but their industrial capabilities and economic power were just a fraction of the United States' potential. By the end of the war, Nazi Germany's GDP was probably on par with the Soviet Union and only a quarter of the size of the United States. And so while the Sherman tank was not the best tank on paper, it was definitely the best tank on the battlefield simply because it was there and available in very large numbers. So there you have it guys, the Techno Union was the industrial heart of the Separatist Alliance and Confederacy of Independent Systems. If Emperor Palpatine had not been meddling with the war on both sides, it's very possible that the CIS and their advantage in manufacturing could have won the war, or at least forced the Republic to negotiate much more favorable terms than they got at the end of the Clone Wars. Well guys, let me know in the comment section below if you enjoyed this video, and also maybe we can cover some more corporations if you guys are into these kind of things. As usual, we always love drawing comparisons between real world things and the Star Wars universe we all love. Well guys, thanks for joining us today. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.